Also, to replace the bone marrow and the immune system of children who unfortunately sometimes get immune attacks and sometimes they lose their immune system through viruses or through bad luck. And also now we're developing brand new clinical treatments for a wide variety of diseases such as children with cerebral palsy, diabetes, cleft palate problems and bone. And I'll give you a few examples of these in a minute. And we're doing research. Now how do we do it? Well, this is the umbilical cord, and you can see running through it the blood, and you can see here the needle going into the cord. We always give priority to the mother and the child. We never interfere with the birthing process. The mother and the child must come first. And then, once everything's done with the mother and child and everything's safe, then we can collect the cord blood. And in our hands, and we've done this thousands and thousands of times, 95% of children's cord bloods are collectible, although none of it's done in Ireland right now. And it's simple and safe, and it takes about three minutes to do it. Three minutes. This is the placenta. Sorry for those of you who have just had dinner. Um, <laughs> although some of you have children, so you've probably seen this. And you can see the umbilical cord here, absolutely full of blood, rich in stem cells. And as the uh, embryo is developing, it starts to produce the uh, umbilical cord very early on. And eventually, you have a lot of blood in this cord, which the child doesn't need. And then we can very, very quickly collect this and send it to the laboratory. We then process the cord blood. This is a whole cord blood. And then we separate out the different parts of the cord blood so we can get the stem cells in this layer just here. This is what umbilical cord blood stem cells look like when you first look at them by a microscope. They are, in fact, to look at, unbelievably boring. <laughs> and in fact, most stem cells are, when you first look at them, unbelievably boring. It's not until you look at them with high technology and in high generation and start to really analyze them, that you start to unlock their secrets. And if you look at this small patch here, this patch is telling me that this is a very active stem cell. And using our own computer-generated technology, we can totally unwrap the world of the cell to understand what it's doing. If you put stem cells close, but not too close, they throw out amazing projections to communicate with each other. And sometimes in a human being, when these projections are cut inside an adult, sometimes this is why you get disease. This is why you get Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, and sometimes this is why you get other diseases such as cancers. And so by understanding how the cells in your body are communicating like this over big distances, we can try to work towards trying to cure people of serious disease. But, no kidding around, this is a long journey. Now, when I first started working on Luke, who had diamond black anemia, the only thing that was treatable with cord blood stem cells was a disease called Fanconi's anemia. And that was uh, in the 1990s. And then after that, within five years, there was still only five or six diseases treatable with cord blood stem cells. Ten years ago, it was, it was about ten. And then, in the last five to ten years, we've had an explosion. We've been able to treat cancers, hematological blood disorders, immune deficiencies of the immune system, and then we started to treat other things like metabolic disorders and liver disorders, and we started to work towards new therapies. Now, when we first started working on this, there was only one. Ten years ago, there was about ten. Today, we have 75 different treatments for umbilical cord blood, using umbilical cord blood stem cells. And there are another 15 in clinical trials across the world. That's 85 different things you can treat with cord blood stem cells, while still none with embryonic. So, another problem. It's not always about money. If there are no stem cells in a stem cell bank, this means no one gets treated. And this is a bad thing. So our team did a survey across different cord blood banks across the world in 2008. And you can see some cord blood banks that just started in places like Turkey with 20 children's blood stored. And the UK, which had about 8,000. Taiwan, which had 25,000. And you'll probably notice here that Ireland is not on this list. It is still not on this list. 
And you can see that the total number of cord blood stored was less than a million. Now, according to World Health Organization figures, 130 million children are born every year, which means that we do not have enough cord blood stem cells frozen in hospitals or in cord blood banks anywhere in the world to even treat the children who need therapies today. So we must encourage our governments, and including Ireland, which has debated this and talked about it, but never really got around to it, to set up cord blood banks in every major metropolitan country so that we have enough cord blood to treat our children today for things like leukemia that we could be helping them with. And so people say to me often when I meet health ministers, they say, well, do we really need stem cells? Well, the University of Utrecht did a very interesting study in 2008, and they said that one in 435 of you will probably need your own stem cells, and one in 400 will need somebody else's stem cells. Now, 20 years ago, when I first started getting work in this area, the statistics were probably more like they were saying one in 50,000, because there just wasn't enough data or evidence out there that stem cells could work. But now there's a lot of evidence. And these statistics show us that for all the children being born, we must start to think about using cord blood. We can't just talk about it and say it's a good idea. We have to lobby ministers to do it. What can we do with cord blood apart from treating cancers and so on? Where, where, what are we going to do next? Well, in 2000, I think it was uh, around about 2000, 2001, we first produced liver from cord blood. And we didn't really believe it, in fact. And I was specializing in blood diseases and immune system diseases, and I had never made a liver before. And <laughs> it was not really the sort of thing I had really dreamed about creating when I was growing up in Ballymena. <laughs> you know, here we are. And um, so I thought, well, we'd better find a liver specialist and make sure we know what we're doing and make sure that uh, he says that we're right. And then we found out that we were right. But we didn't tell anybody and we didn't do anything about it. And we decided not to tell the media, we decided not to tell anybody because we, we didn't want to make fuss about it and we didn't think people would believe us and we thought embryonic people would attack us again. But uh, unfortunately, someone leaked it to the press in 2005, and then it was in all the front pages of the newspapers around the world that we had made liver. And this was, in fact, the first plate of liver cells that we ever made. And it doesn't look very sophisticated, but these are the cells that process your uh, food, and these are the cells that process your hormones uh, in your body. And these are the cells that detoxify you, and so on and so on. And we did it in these um, special bioreactors, and we realized very early on that producing stem cells is very hard, but to take them from stem cells into a tissue, an organ, is even harder. So we realized that we have to start working with engineers across the world and people specializing in chemistry across the world and bring all these people together. We couldn't just do this in Ballymena. We had to do this in around the world. And in fact, this first bioreactor was made for us by the Brazilian Space Authority. Now, most of you probably didn't realize that the Brazil had a space authority, but they were quite tired of paying America to put their TV satellites in space, so they decided to do the space program too. And then we started working with NASA and other people to develop special reactors to grow cells in 3D. And so what happens is really, it just speeds up the growth. So on the first day, you don't have much going on. But in only five days, you start to see the liver cells leaping in and around the plate and growing into something which is a bit more like liver tissue. Now, it is a little bit far, far away from the clinic right now, but what we're looking at now is being able for a child who has taken an overdose of a household drug or a chemical to be able to take these small blobs of liver and put them back into the child to give the child's liver a holiday from doing its own toxicity and reducing the attack on the body and then allowing this to take the heat off the child until the child's liver can come back on its own. That's the overall aim of this. So we're not really in the science fiction territory of creating an entire brain, an entire heart, an entire liver. What we're trying to do is to put just enough stem cells into you to help your system to come back on its own. And this is a true uh, direction of regenerative medicine. Why is this important? Well. 500 million people worldwide, especially in the third world, are infected by hepatitis, and 5% of these go on to get very serious cirrhosis, 
And this is before you look at children taking overdoses or adults with alcoholism or drug abuse or any of these things. In chronic liver disease in the United States, it's the tenth leading cause of death with 360 hospitalizations and a $10 billion healthcare spend. So anyone that says that we shouldn't be looking at stem cells to help these people is just crazy. Now let me give you another example. Are stem cells needed? One in 400 children will go on to be diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. 8% of the population will get one type or another of diabetes. Diabetes is seventh leading cause of death. The risk of stroke and heart disease is two to four times higher in these children. Diabetes is the leading cause of kidney failure. And the cost in the uh, United States in 2007 was $174 billion, and it's pretty much equal in Europe. Now, we had made liver, and we weren't sure if we could make other things, so we thought, well, let's just try and make pancreas. <laughs> <laughs> so we did. And so we were the first people to go and take a mother and put the cord blood stem cells and develop them into what we call insulin secreting pancreatic blood cells. Again, with an idea to try to use the child's own cord or cord blood cells to be able to put them back into them when needed to try to help restock the pancreas of a child that's been attacked by type 1 diabetes. In diabetes, your own immune system starts to shred your own pancreas and you don't produce your own insulin anymore, so you have to inject insulin all the time. So our idea is to try to use the child's own cord blood, or somebody else's cord blood sometimes, to treat these children. Here, uh, just to give you an idea of what it looks like, this is the world's first artificial cord blood islet, made into a pancreatic islet tissue, which we did about five years ago. And this one, which looks even better, is made from mesenchymal stem cells which has different hormonal activities, and the idea is to be able to take these little blobs and put them back into the pancreas of children who have been affected by diabetes. And we're now working with people in Korea and people in America to try to speed this up towards the clinic as fast as we can possibly do it. Another possibility that uh, we started to realize we, we could do is, uh, with bone marrow and with cord blood, you can make things like bone and cartilage. And I haven't really worked on what, what I call hard tissues before. I've worked on liver tissue, which is sort of squishy, and pancreatic tissue, which is squishy, and brain-related tissue, which is kind of squishy. But bone is quite hard tissue, and cartilage is quite hard tissue. And I got approached by some people from Switzerland and India who said, well, we have a big problem with these children with cleft palate. And uh, this particular child here, you can see, is missing a full bone and some cartilage towards the nose. And in fact, this is right across the world. And you can see here all different levels of it, from mild through to very severe. Some children just have a raisin, but they still have their teeth. And some children have a whole bone missing right through to the nose. What happens to these children? In the third world, they're not identified in utero, and they tend to be born, and then we give them surgery. In the Western world, they're often identified by ultrasound, and they're often aborted. Now, when you consider that this is not a life-threatening illness, this can be treated with conventional surgery by taking a piece of hip bone and putting it into the cleft and regenerating the palate. Uh, there's no real issue for aborting these children, but unfortunately, in many Western countries, and nearly every single child in Cyprus in the last five years has been identified with cleft palate has been aborted because of this, because 